Wagwan, everybody. Welcome to the Dis Afimi History Podcast, where we'll be speaking about history and as well family history and how history relates in terms of Caribbean people um, for the present as well as in the past and how in the past what that does and brings forth for what we are going through at present and what we can learn from our history from our family and take that moving forward so I do hope you enjoy the podcast and if you like it please ensure to subscribe like and review thank you we'll start the the podcast and I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on uh, to the podcast to be able to, you know, discuss a little bit more about your article that you wrote, um, kind of going back into your journey of your heritage. So um, I'll get you just to start off to introduce yourself to everyone. So my name is Maria Del Padar-Caldi, and I'm an associate fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, which is part of the University of London. Um, and that's where I'm based. Mm -hmm. and um, I work specifically on the history of indenture in in the Caribbean Um, and I I work on an idea um, additionally called uh, called the other Windrush which is my exploration of how the stories of Indian Caribbean people who came to UK as part of the Windrush are not really being uh, amplified or shared in the way that they could be. Thank you so much for that. Yes, and you know, the article that you wrote, it was uh, a daughter's journey from indenture to Windrush. So I just wanted to ask, you know, what was your why to write this article? Well, you know what? Um, so the editor of that book, Grace Anisha Ali, who's a curator um, based in the United States, she contacted me to say that she was trying to assemble an anthology of writing by Guyanese women. Oh. And did I have anything to contribute? And at the time, I think that would have been around 2015, 2016. And at the time, my son was really little. And this idea of um, the journey of indenture to Windrush, I can remember specifically when it came to my mind. So I was on a bus with my son and we were going past a cinema in, or a former cinema in Kensington High Street, Um, because all the old cinemas in in London had started closing down and they were either upgrading the buildings, turning them into cafes or, and it struck me as we passed this cinema, I remember saying to my son on the bus, you know that, that building there, it used to be beautiful, it used to be a cinema. Um, And I was aware that um, I was no longer one sort of floating generation in London that in the process of having my son, Mm -hmm. um, I had rooted myself specifically to this city. And, you know, the more, as he got older and I started to share more stories with him, I had this strong sense of being, I, I, I'm actually a child of Windrush and feeling, you know, um, even though I had studied the history of indenture before, and but just understanding that my dad was also part of the Windrush migration, but because he was Indian Caribbean and his story wasn't seen as part of the Windrush generation, in spite of the presence of people like Naipaul, and Selvon, both Indian, in the same migration. And I thought, well, hold on, you know, actually, I need to say, I need to speak (laughs) um, about this, um, you know, about this migration, because it's now become, I felt more of a responsibility because I, well, now I have a child, and if I don't say something, what, you know, what is he inheriting? Definitely. Uh, Yeah, and I remember getting uh I remember just playing around when I got home with this the other Windrush and Venture to Windrush and looking at two photos which are, are are really significant to me. One is my father's passport photo, which appears in in the article um, that you read. And the other photo is the photo of my great grandfather who was in in my maternal um grandmother's side the first of our um of our ancestors to be born in Guyana. And those two photos were really important visual 
connections to me to understand in general, you know, this story of indentured to Windrush, how we had, and I remember kind of later on coming up with this line, I organised an event at the University of London called Indenture to Windrush, Invisible Passengers in Two Imperial Migrations. And it was the idea that the history, here in the UK, the history of indenture is widely unknown and unacknowledged. And then you have this second migration, um, uh of what so Windrush is um is known is talked about but what isn't known is that Indian people and indeed Chinese um Caribbean people were part of this migration also and um because people don't know that there are any people in the Caribbean um they don't understand us to have been part of that migration I thought you know it's that you know that idea of having this small person <laughs> yeah that you have responsibility for and you don't want to experience perhaps the same rootlessness that you that you may have experienced and it so it was that it was that this that I, I do remember that moment because I, I remember looking at him and looking at the cinema and thinking you know there's a line that connects um me and him and my memories and if I if I don't draw it for him um I will risk that he won't see um this really rich history that that he's part of no, definitely, and definitely a rich history. And uh, I guess well, until you get the next generation, then the connections start to start to appear and connect. So, you know, you know, yeah. what was your experience, especially as a first generation in the United Kingdom, and yeah. was there a connection to your parents, you know, heritage? Um, you know what, there wasn't, and it was quite. Um, it was really bleak. It was really bleak. I don't remember anything um positive or happy about that time so I'm the child of a mixed marriage my dad um was Indian Guyanese and my mom was um uh was Spanish and what they had done in crossing the color bar at that time was very bold mm -hmm. um, and uh, and very brave but for I think for many reasons their marriage was not a happy one they struggled there were five there were five of us at home. And what I remember kind of most distinctly about that period is, is in the UK during the 70s and 80s, there was a real, I mean, it was a very, I mean, it was a very, very racist. And, and I remember quite violently racist time. Um, but there was a particular hatred of um, Asian communities and Asian people at that time and the word I, I won't repeat it but there was a word specifically associated um with um with that sort of racism that people would hurl it at you in the street so casually yeah you know somebody would just pass you by and use it and um I remember you know I, I, I do remember my brothers experiencing more of the violent side of that racism people would call me that name, but not really, not really necessarily trying to start a fight with me or, yeah. but I, I don't know if I, I, I can't remember now if I wrote about it in that article or a subsequent article, this moment that really, sh and because it would have been one of my earliest memories yeah. was of some kids, some neighborhood children throwing dog mess yeah. on the windows of, um, on the windows of the house. And it happened to be on the window of the room that I was sleeping in. And it was, um, it's quite a memory to have because it's the it's the sense of somebody saying this is what you are to us this is what you are yeah. um, to pick up excreta and chuck it at the you know to throw it at the house and and I think that what was unique about our experience is we were not part of a community um, and I you know later on when I met British Asian people. Um, and I spoke to them about my experiences growing up, I think that a lot of the difference came from the fact that we were alone. So we had no, um, my dad had second cousins here, but they lived quite, um, they didn't live near us and he didn't really, you know, he didn't really keep in contact that much with us. So we were really alone. My mum had left her family in Spain. She came here after her parents had died. And it was that sense of having nowhere else to go um, and my parents also having made that decision that I think perhaps a lot of, I think perhaps a lot of people did in the seventies in the UK, not to give us this cultural heritage, not to talk about 
where they were from because they believed that in doing so they were burdening us or um, I think my mum particularly believed that she would be disadvantaging us educationally in the sense that there was a real there was a real xenophobia at that time um so if if I, I remember all the children that spoke Spanish and Portuguese um being kind of in one line in a classroom mm -hmm. um, and and their tables being separate two hours and it was almost as and they were not um uh, as, as though to say well you speak another language at home therefore you must need some support your English must be wanting in somehow which was not the case um, but there was, <laughs> so I think she she thought, well, let me kind of, if I present these children as English, as British, um, then, you know, everything will be fine. And I mean, even more so, kind of, you know, I'm looking at the picture, I have two pictures of all of my brothers in front of me, and I'm, I'm looking at them now, they're like in their 70s clothes. And, and you know, the idea of saying at that time, well, these kids are, uh, are English, they're British, you know, or even saying that to us, which they did it's you know it, it would never have been accepted <laughs> no, um, for sure. yeah 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 and so um it, I mean it was it was it was a it was a bleak time inside the house and I outside the house um and yeah with kind of with little I, I don't th think I remember things as being you know um I don't remember there being anything joyful although you know it's funny my I spoke was speaking to one of my older brothers recently and he said to me, do you know everyone was really happy when you were born? And uh, I said, really? And he said, yeah, but well, because you were a girl. There were four boys and then suddenly there was a girl and everyone was really happy. And he said, he, he said, mummy and daddy were really happy. And I was thinking, wow, you know, how, you know, because I don't, I mean, obviously that's not my memory. Yes. Um, but yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, I think it's important to challenge my perception of events in, in that um uh, there was a story before I was born, and my older brothers do remember that as well as the, as well as kind of the sadness that came after when the marriage struggled and when you know, um, and when my mm -hmm. parents very obviously weren't getting along. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it definitely gives the whole story of how challenging it it would have been at that time. And yeah. again, you know, not a real sense of I guess inclusion in society, or did you feel that you didn't fit in anywhere? um no no I did I did I really felt that um I, I didn't fit in anywhere I'm trying to think if there were any pockets or spaces um you know or moments and I've, I've written very recently for for a magazine called The Phenambulist yes. um about about being a teenager and there was one moment I remember which was there's an actress called Sarita Chowdhury who was in a movie called Mississippi Masala when I was very young yes. and she was in Sex in the City but she did a photo shoot with a magazine called Sky when I was maybe 14, 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. And um, she just looked absolutely gorgeous in this photo shoot. And I was totally taken aback because I had never seen a woman of South Asian heritage um, uh, being a model. And um, that was a big, that was a, that was a big thing in my mind. Like, wow, you know, it's, it's acceptable because um, you know, we talk about kind of, you know, memories of being, um, memories of hearing abusive terms and abusive words and, and um, particularly that very visual, um, you know, searing image of somebody throwing dog crap against your window and people saying, you know, um, these awful things to see something held up in that um, or someone from your community held up in that way as something attractive. That that was a big that was a big deal to me. That was a really big deal to me. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, I guess you know, how did this kind of shape or frame your outlook at that time for you know for yourself? Mm. Um. Gosh, it's yeah, it's difficult to you know. <laughs> Kind of, if I go back at that time, I was really, kind of, I, I was really just lost. I think we all were. I think, you know, what has subsequently been, I mean, I've lost two of my brothers. I've, I've written about, mm -hmm. I've written about my brothers a lot. But the two um, that are still with me have often called me up. Um, and after reading my work 
and said, you know, and said how much they felt they felt it, that they felt their they felt that story that they, you know, um uh and that you know to me just to have that audience of two yes. <laughs> it's a big deal for me because it's the two people who lived through what I lived through and I have to say kind of there was there there were very few moments of um there were very few moments where I wasn't feeling like everything was hopeless I think you know the fact that I um you know one wonderful thing my mom did was to teach us all to read very early very very early she didn't rely on the school to do it and um the the one thing that I was allowed to do on my own was go to the library I think from the time I was quite young I was allowed to go to the library on my own my mum would take us to the library too when we were when we were too small and that was my my escape portal um and as I got older it became more of an escape portal and more than an escape portal it it came to um, books came to represent somewhere where I could belong or where I could be and it's funny now that that's how I <laughs> that's how I've made you know um, that's how I've made my world my my career kind of um, is is about books is about writing and wow libraries. yeah that's really great because I mean I guess that was your piece that was your comfort um, to be able to kind of use books to escape yes yeah yeah um, and that's it's funny I, I if I think about it now I think there are at least two of my brothers that that were similar in that you know mm. um yeah yeah and then so I guess you know when was the first time that you really investigated the heritage of your father and mm. what was that caused by a certain event or just a, yeah. a feeling to move forward with that well I got to you know I, I left so I left school at 15 which is really young here you're not allowed to leave school until you're 16 but I left school at 15 I was very rebellious as a teenager and um I I had kind of a series of dead-end jobs and I remember a feeling you know I, I think just before I turned 18 just kind of feeling this is this is going to be me you know, if I don't, you know, if I don't do something, this is going to be me. And I, um, uh, you know, I could kind of see my life stretching out in front of me. I'm imagining a lot of the women I was working with at the time um, were around the same age I am now. They would have been in their 40s. And um, so it was very clear to me I was on a church and they had been doing the same thing. And I, I you know, I, I could and my dad I remember my dad actually also saying to me so many times you know this is not you know is this what you want you know you want to be like me working you know working on your feet uh 12 14 hours a day um and I um I, I thought you know there is, it's a question isn't it is this what you want because if you want it fine but if you don't want it now's the time to do something about it and and I I I I, I guess that I thought well, let me start to see. I wasn't confident at all. I had no confidence at all. But I thought, let me start to see if it's possible I can do something about it. And um, I very slowly, um, so I, I was with a correspondence college and I very slowly just started studying, taking an exam here and there. And eventually I got to, um, I got to the stage where I was able to take an A-level in, in English literature. And that that was uh, that will still be um, I think even even though I have a doctor now that will still be the the biggest ac academic achievement of my life because I'd done it on my own it was my you know um, you know I'd sat at a desk I didn't have a teacher I had somebody I sent an assignment to once in a while um, and and yeah it, it was a huge moment because I thought well that's something that I've achieved something. And with this something, I can, you know, I could maybe I could go to university, and yeah, yeah. So it was a, it was a really big deal for me. It was a really yeah. big, you know, something that kids here will, um, you know, they may get three or four A levels. That happens, you know. Um, but I had one, <laughs> and I think that one meant as much to me as somebody having having three or four because because of what it signified at that age. It meant that you could. Um, you could apply to be a mature student at university, which is what I did. Yeah. And at the University of Leeds, 
I had two amazing, so I did literature, but at the University of um, Leeds, the, in the Department of English, you do combine language and literature, and it wasn't my literature professors who inspired me at all. It was two of the language, yeah, it was two of the, it was two of the academics who worked in, in language. And I remember one of them saying to me um, on that first week of, of study, um, he, he asked me where, where my name came from. And I said, oh, my dad is from Guyana. And he said, oh, do you know my favorite lecturer at university was from Guyana? And I thought, oh, wow. You know, oh, because to me, Guyana was a small country. I didn't know anyone else from there. Somebody told me once the cast of Desmond's were, my dad told me that the cast of Desmond's were from Guyana, but didn't really know anything more about it. And I thought, oh, wow, an academic from Guyana, that's, you know. <laughs> and then another, um, uh, and then another lecturer had asked me, um, had asked me something about my name. And she said, do you know, do you know how your ancestors came to to Guyana from India and I said because all I knew at the time was Kali then meant gift of Kali that's all I knew yes yeah that's that's what I um because somebody else had told me and uh I said that and uh I said I don't I don't really know and I asked my dad um and he said to me oh well you can uh, you can blame the European sweet tooth for why your ancestors came and I didn't really get it I didn't know mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> yeah, it was it was kind of they are. I remember in those modules they would ask a lot about about names and origins of names and your history and your culture and how that affected uh, language. Mm -hmm. um, you know whether you were bilingual or whether you were um, whether you phrase things a, a certain way and um, yeah. And I um, I remember for example one of my brothers. Um, he used to roll his R's like a Spaniard, even though he didn't speak oh. Spanish. Because he was his main contact was with my mum. Mm -hmm. uh, he was just copying her accent, and exactly. so for a long time he spoke <laughs> 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 Spanish. So they presented to me this idea that there are traces of your, uh, you know, we're we're all carrying pieces yeah. of our of our, and that to me was at the time it seems silly now but it was that to me was revolutionary you know this idea that I am the sum um of all these people that have come before me yeah. and that whether I can see it or not this you know um this history is present in me <clears throat> if it's in my name if it's in the way I might pronounce certain words or um you know uh the things i you know the things i hold genetically like asthma or it's there it's all there yeah, yeah. and yeah and it was so it was from there that um it's it's i think it was serendipity that my i i my dad brought family to to leeds to visit me his sisters came from toronto to visit him oh, he wow. brought them to, leeds to visit me and it was it was then that um it was it was around that time um, but I began to ask questions and they um, they would talk to me about um, what they remembered of their their parents, their parents and their grandparents stories. Wow. It's it's always, you know, just the um, it, it always comes out of kind of nowhere, so to speak, in this in yeah. sense of who's going to kind of initiate or spark that, you know, that little fire, so to speak, for you mm. to kind of really look at things and 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 decide but you're right it's definitely within us it's just for us to kind of recognize that um other yeah. than being told you know you laugh something similar to you know so and so yeah. back home type of thing yes so. yes <laughs> <laughs> you know so but and so with your, you know, relatives coming over from Canada, like what were you able to uncover of the indenture to Windrush and how did that make you feel? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember now um, what what I spoke about with my dad's, with my dad's sisters. So they told me, um, they told me, I don't know how much they would have told me about the system of indenture. They talked about yeah. their parents a bit. And uh, I think what they told me specifically may have been that my my uncle um, had in the nineties, which many pe people weren't doing then, that he had actually gone to the archives in Guyana and got copies of our yeah of our um, 
of our great grandparents' indenture certificates um, oh, or gosh. emigration passes. I think would be more um, more correct to say. And um, uh, oh, I and you know what? I remember my uh, one of my aunts talking to me a lot about this man Carnadin that we got our name from. And that was, I found that so intriguing about how many children he had uh, mm -hmm. about, you know what she told me, in, I remember this, it instilled a sense of pride in me yes. because I thought he, she made it seem like, you know, um, which, you know, subsequently having studied the history, I do, I realized that this was quite remarkable um, because he had managed to get the last he and his uh, and his and his older sons have managed to get the last son off the plantation, so that my dad, yeah, so that my dad was um, was the son of a tailor. Which, if you think within a within a, and that would have been because all of um, all of my grandfather's brothers would have worked hard to get him, yeah. To school so that he would have been so that that they were able to affect that change you know within yeah within the space of a generation is 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 really incredible yeah that's um, really yeah important. yeah yeah so i mean so then the you know did this discovery you know make you more connected to your heritage or disconnected no it made me you know what it made me more connected and i i kind of resolved then to um, you know that was quite a year. That year was quite a year because it was also in that in that year I was doing a module in um, I was doing a module in literature that was looking at some Caribbean writers, and I just remember being on um, I just remember being on a chair in the library and just stretching, just just flicking out and stretching, mm -hmm. and I caught I caught an um, I caught the side of a book with my eye and it, the spelling of the name was at the end of the name was D double E N. And I thought, oh, that's like my name. And it was a book by the Guyanese writer, David Dabardine, who I didn't know, I had never heard of him. And it was called The Intended. It was a novel called The Intended. And I pulled it off the shelf and it was, uh, um, it was just, I flicked it back and looked at the back, I looked at the author profile. And it said that it was a story of a young man coming to London from Guyana and, uh, you know, his difficulties growing up. Mm -hmm. And that the person that wrote it was a professor of literature at the University of Warwick. And I was like, holy, you know, you are, you know, you're kidding me. Somebody from Guyana wrote a book about growing up in yeah. London. Yeah. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and how difficult that was and the, and the Indian Guyanese you know mm -hmm. um, because I didn't think you know at the time this identity to me I mean it would seem strange to anybody who's grown up in Queens or who's grown up in Toronto perhaps even yeah but there are not really and there weren't really at that time communities of or spaces mm -hmm. uh, in social media where you could go and say I'm Indian Caribbean is there anyone else out there mm -hmm. that is like me but the library was that social network, right? Yes. Um, where you could go and perhaps find <laughs> in different ways people who were like you. And so when I when I read that, I was like, oh my God. You know, there's a book by this man. He's Indian guy. Are there any more? And there was, there was a great collection in the library of writing by because people treat wow. presses in these, of course. And they have published loads of books by um uh, by Indian Caribbean writers. And so, yeah, that was that was life changing for me because those writers inevitably talk about indenture. Yeah. Um, and um, so it's through it's through kind of a combination of literature and history that I begun to understand what the system was. And then I went to Canada. I spoke to my uncle. I got copies of the indenture certificates. I read more, and that's when I, I kind of uh, this idea took hold that um, that I would do my masters in research um in in care so the two things were happening at the same time I was professionally yeah. exploring it and personally exploring it wow that's quite the journey and, <laughs> that's, <laughs> and quite the you know the all the understanding and you know just the the whole scope of that so you know yeah. with that journey yeah. of discovery like how did that change your relationship with your immediate and your extended family as well well you know with it, it brought you know what I have always I, I I want can't say I have always been because my dad passed away um, yeah. around this time last year, 
Um, but I was always close to my dad. I think my dad was, although I didn't know what his cultural identity was, I understood that, that, you know, somebody said to me recently, I was talking about my relationship between my parents, I love my mum very much, but, you know, she was, she was unable to understand the things that we went through. She was white. And until she opened her mouth, she didn't experience discrimination. And when she did, it was a different type of discrimination. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, my dad was there for me and believed in me and fought for me um, in, in, in a very, in a very, uh aggressive and you know poignant way you know he was you know he was really you know he was really behind me somebody said to me recently um I understand Maria your dad was your parent mm -hmm. and that is exactly what it was you know without you know um you know without about talking my mum who was you know in her own way incredible mm -hmm. incredible woman my dad was my parent he parented me I am his child you know and um, uh, I always, even without knowing the history, I understood this is my, you know, this is my parent. This is where I come from. And the more I knew about it, the more I shared it with him. And then I kind of understood that it wasn't, it wasn't that he had denied me a history. It's that he had also been denied a history. Yes. Yeah. And that, that, that was, so to be able to share that with him, was was a wonderful thing was a really wonderful thing yeah I'm sure that must have you know brought back a lot and as well for again another set of discovery for himself yeah. as well because with this with indenture it's you know it's not necessarily very clear-cut sure. in terms of with people for where their history really is from as well within that um, within that context as well yeah so and so, I, you know, you discussed, you know, your father, but, you know, was, would you be able to provide any some insights as to, you know, why your father may not have discussed his family heritage further yeah. other than he didn't know? Yeah, no, um, I mean, I, you know, one thing it has been a real privilege to kind of to get to know and to understand is um, why people were reluctant to talk about the past of their children yeah. so one thing I was I was writing recently an article for um for an academic type of magazine it's called the conversation mm -hmm. and um, there's a part there where I, I quote David Dabberdine who's subsequently become my colleague we we've worked together on a couple of books but there was a really moving um section of a documentary he made on indenture not just in Guyana but also mm -hmm. uh, with Bridge Lowell in Fiji and Gandhi's granddaughter in South Africa. So they filmed the three of them talking about, separately talking about their roots. There's a very moving part in that documentary where David Dabdine is standing in the, in the archives in Guyana and he's talking about the condition of the volumes there and saying that they have been exposed to, um, they've been exposed to the elements in a way that they shouldn't have been, they should be protected. And he's very, you can see he's upset, but he doesn't want to, he doesn't want the staff to hear what he's saying. Yes. And he says, he says in a whisper, I really believe that people don't want to remember the past. This is not a past of castles and Arthurian legends. This mm -hmm. is a past of shame, you know? Yes. And I, um, I mean, I don't view in any way those um, those people that made that that journey as shameful. I see them as warriors. You know, I think they yeah. were incredible. Um, if I look at the story, for example, of my dad's uh, great grandmother who came with um, with a young child mm. on her own. Who knows? Who knows why she made that journey on her own? Um, I, I mean, I just think, and that she survived yes. and she, she prospered even. Um, and, you know, um, my dad has memories of that little girl. She, you know, she came over with, um, who lived, she lived well into her eighties. And I, I think they were incredible people, but I think that, um, indentured servitude, you know, that idea of, of, um, um, of you being, you being considered a disposable unit of labor, which which indentured laborers were, um, it it colored the way that they 
that they viewed themselves and uh and their condition and what they wanted for for their offspring for their for their children so um there's a there's an academic here called Clem Cicheran who's who's also Guyanese and he talks a lot about this idea of collective amnesia yeah. um, in the generation that would have been his his grandparents um, and my grandparents also um, and you know this idea that whatever they had left in India um, many of the people that travelled would have been would have been you know uh, impoverished. Some people were were fleeing famine. Mm -hmm. So this idea that, you know, we, we're here now, we don't need to talk about who we were there in India. We don't need to talk about who we may have left behind. Um, you know, maybe people were ashamed of having left their, um, their family. Maybe people were escaping a spouse or familial obligations they were unable to fulfill. There are so many reasons why um, people indentured um, a lot were, we need to say a lot were duped as well. Um, yes. uh, a lot were told things that weren't true about where they were going, how long it would take to get there, um, when they might be able to return. So there was a lot of dishonesty around the, mm -hmm. um, around the system. So um, you can, I mean, with all those things in mind, you can understand why people didn't want to, didn't want to talk. But having said that, people must have because you know we're here and we're able to tell stories about it. So those two things kind of coexist, this silence with a few breaks in the silence here and there, a few brave people who said, you know, like one of my aunts said to me um, a few years ago, she sat me down and said, um, nobody is gonna tell you this except for me, but if your grandmother was alive, she would have wanted you to know. And she proceeded to tell me this, fa um, this family story. And I thought, wow, that's, you know, it's those little ruptures that kind of, you know, are so important for people like me because, um, you know, we're trying to bring as many stories as we can together to, to you know, to pass on for, you know, the people that come after us, which I guess this is, that's what this is all for, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Just so we can, you know, know what that story is like, yeah. however it may be shaded um, and how people may, be able to view it but it is there and it is to say that you have the history right so yeah you know we all have that and and just like how you're you know you're tapping into your heritage you know how has that changed your viewpoint moving forward and you know what has it you know for you to ensure that this is communicated again to the next generation yeah um so i mean all of my i've got to say that all of my work and my writing is um uh, you know, it's kind of about this history and about um, challenging this silence, yeah. because I think that's the most important thing that we can do. Yes. I do not judge mm -hmm. anyone who wants to keep silent about their past. I think there are there yes. are so many reasons why people choose to do so. But I think that those of us can must who can must speak. You know, I think that that's really important. Um, and I feel, I've got to say, I have never in my life felt stronger than that moment I came back from Guyana with my dad. That was, that was just incredible, you know. Um, for someone, you know, for someone not born in that country, um, you know, to be able to visit it for, for the first time, you know, with the person who connects you to it, mm -hmm. that was priceless. That was really priceless, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of emotions would have come through for you at that time. And, yeah. you know, everything going through your, you know, what you're thinking about and, mm -hmm. and probably, you know, questioning some of your, you know, your your thoughts of, you know, why did we have to have this type of um, life? But at least it gives you a different kind of viewpoint. And, and, I, and I totally agree with what you're saying. Not everybody is on the same journey mm -hmm. and can be able to, as you said, discuss. And so we yeah. have to respect that. But for the yeah. ones that are going to discuss and they are going to talk about it, you know, yeah. there's a reason for that um, energy and that drive to for them to continue, you know, to yeah. further discuss and push that out there um, so mm -hmm. people can be able to connect to it. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, I agree totally. Yeah. And I know that you mentioned a little bit about your mother, but would you be investigating that side the maternal side of your family as well or 
You know, it's so funny you ask that at this moment where we're talking about silence because um, I I did it. You know, I'm ta- I was talking about kind of my dad being my parent and yeah. um, essentially my mum being this, and I'm sure she felt this way as well. I'm sure she felt this way. Um, uh, you know, just this this Spanish woman who lived in the house with us. <laughs> And it took me a long time to understand her as my mother. Um, and, I, I, and I think she deliberately kind of separated herself from us. Uh, and I, I don't know, um, uh, I mean, I'm sure there were a lot of, you know, when you're older, you understand your parents in a totally yeah. different way. Yeah. And I, I am sure that for a woman who had come um, from a different country to live in the UK parents have passed away mm-hmm. she had no other family would you know I am sure that she must have felt incredibly alone and um, you know not not um, not with any intention just kind of cut herself off from us and um, it's funny at the point that I submitted my master's I remember my mum saying to me do you want to uh, do you want to come to Spain with me I'd like to take you to Spain Oh, and uh, and I was just thinking, where you know, where did that come from? You know, mm-hmm. um, uh, and what you know, what is it connected to? And I, I wonder if you know, I'm thinking at the age she was, I wonder if she thought, you know, what I'm going to die, and all this child is going to remember is that her dad was Guyanese. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of like, yeah, I'll come. You know, I'll come for. Um, of course, let's just go. You know, we went. We had never been particularly close. Yeah. Um, but that journey became a pattern where we would go. Um, so I was in my, I think mean, I was in my mid twenties when that's when that started around then. Mm-hmm. Where we would go to Spain, kind of uh, once a year or um, every couple of years, and I, I'm just you know, I, I remember asking her once something about Franco, um, and about the time that she, you know, about the time that she'd grown up in Spain and about growing up under a dictatorship, kind of half you know, half interested, half not. And it was just the way that she responded to me. Um, it was so chilling because she was talking about, you know, she was talking about the existence in in um, in the history of Spain of people snitching on each other and just go, like somebody, the butcher doesn't like the baker, mm-hmm. the butcher goes to the authorities and said, I know the baker say something bad about the regime. And just you know, but it was just the way she said it. I was kind of like, oh my god, you know that that. Um, and I remember her talking also. She would open up a little bit more, and t- she would talk to me about her dad being very scared of her discussing politics outside the house. Wow. And I kind of thought, you know, when the more then the more I learned about that period of time about dictatorship, I just thought, oh my god, you know, this mm-hmm. this woman was, you know, this woman was not in any sense a villain. She was a victim of of um she was a victim of this this um this not of the dictatorship directly but of the environment that it created exactly. where a woman had to get permission from a male relative to get a bank account to have a passport to leave the country was not considered an adult until she was 23 um was unable to vote all of those things mm-hmm. uh, that that environment that she grew up in that kind of environment of terror because it is terror you know for you to for you to wake up one morning and learn that somebody in the village is gone yes they're they're not coming back and in all likelihood um uh they may have been um murdered by the authorities because it said that they said something bad about the region that is terror that is real terror um because you are thinking in advance about every kind of everything yes. you say the interaction you have and kind of yeah so yeah I have started to I, I, I a few years ago I began to learn Spanish which is at this age is so hard but I love it I love it and I I, I do I feel so blessed that the more I learn about this past the more I understand my mum and why even though there was a Spanish community here in the UK she was not a part of it at all so there was a very distinct, in contrast to my dad, there was a very distinct Spanish community here in, um, okay. in, in London, but she was never part of it. She wouldn't acknowledge it. And I, I do understand that that was partly perhaps her politics and um, 
uh, the fact that she came from, I would say she came from a relatively middle class background. And, um, and but I think also the um, also this, you know, um, uh, the fact that she had married somebody who was not who was not white, it would not have just been frowned upon. I mean, there are there are very serious issues with with racism in Spain, even now that persists. Yeah. Um, so for her at that time to have married out, as it were, it would have been considered, you know, scandalous in the community. She very deliberately did not maintain those connections, did not um, teach mm. us Spanish and did not say to us when we were children, OK, we're off to Spain. <laughs> yes. Connect with the culture because she never believed Spain would accept us. And I, I, I mean, I, I can totally see, you know, now when I read stories um of um, mixed heritage families in Spain, I can I totally get her making that decision. No, absolutely, and and just for the fact that you mentioned about you know those stories that are being told, so it gives it gives a little bit more context of what this those times would have been, and as well, yeah, it opens yeah. them up to start talking, which you know is yeah. um, it you know when I, when I look back on it, you know when I talk with some family family members. I mean, it gives a connection. It gives them to be open and to give a vulnerability, you know, yeah. to be able to discuss things that they probably hadn't talked about for decades. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, you're so, you, you're you're so right. I remember my dad saying to me, um, you know, I feel so sad now because when I was a teenager, all I wanted to do was go and see the latest movie. <laughs> so I wanted to go and see, um, you know, Burt Lancaster or um, or Kirk Douglas. I didn't. He, he said, "Now you're asking me these questions." I think, why the hell didn't I ask my grandfather or or, uh, or my grandmother? Why didn't I ask them? Who were you? Yeah, you know, this woman born in India, you know, living in Georgetown, Guyana, yeah. uh, well into her eighties. Why didn't I ask her what was your life like in India? Do you remember the journey? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. And I, I really, I, I totally. I totally understand that because I think sometimes we imagine we have all the time in the world. Yes. Yeah. With these people, we don't, you know, we, we really don't. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'll just say for myself, I know my mom would always talk about her yaya and her yaya was her grandmother. And, uh, you know, it was just, just, just to hear that, Oh, you had a grandmother, you know, you don't really <laughs> think of your parents as having, you know, you know their own but when they start talking that way to say you know about their grandparents yeah. when they grow up and what they learned and it, it just makes them a little bit more oh you're you're not just that authoritarian person you you know you can grow up as well right so yeah 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 exactly exactly you it allows you to see the person in all their you know in all their beauty you know this uh, just the idea of my dad and my my mom being scolded by her father please <laughs> you know, do not talk about politics outside this house. Yes. It makes me think, oh, you know, um, this was, you know, she was a young woman who was engaged in politics in Spain at that time in the 50s, mm -hmm. you know, the peak of the dictatorship. How scared must her dad have been, you know? Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. And, and so, yeah. you know, what would you say to anyone that wanted to take a deeper dive into their family history mm -hmm. as a first or second generation um, immigrant? Yeah, I mean, I would say, I'm, I'm, you know, I am aware, Lakshmi Pasur, the, um, the Trinidadian writer, um, passed away, um, I think the day before yesterday, and she would have been in her 80s, and she was one of the few, she was one of the few writers of, um, or one of the few writers who's kind of um, uh, acknowledged and reflected and, and written about the... Um, women's experiences, Indian Caribbean women's experiences as as part of Windrush. And um uh she's passed away, I think she was born the year after my dad, she was born 1939. My father passed away last year. I lost my mum in 2019. Um I've had a series of bereavements and I lost my favorite uh, I know my other brothers won't mind me saying this. I lost my favorite brother in um 2021. And I, I think the thing I would say is um, have have a respectful urgency about what you do um, because you you know life is so short life is so short. I remember on my fortieth birthday, my dad called me up and he said, 
he said just yesterday you were a little girl and I totally get that because I, I feel that way now about my you know about my son it just seemed like a minute ago um I was carrying him around everywhere and now I struggle to keep up with him and mm -hmm. Yeah, I think your time is your time is is so short. You don't have as much time as you think you do, and other things will come into your life um, that will take up your time too. Yeah. So yeah, I would say take a if you are considering looking at your past, have a have a respectful urgency about it, and um, uh, you know, um, you don't be don't be discouraged if. If, if one person won't talk to you or two people won't talk to you don't because if you keep it up um somebody will you know um somebody will share and you know you'll find somebody who wants to talk to you maybe not you know somebody directly involved or but you will you'll find your stories where you find your story so be persistent yeah no i couldn't agree with you more that's very true you definitely will it may not be in the immediate branch but definitely outside of that um, yeah. that you'll be able to find someone, as you said, to tell their stories, because I think for them, it's it's another way of re them reliving that experience too, right? Mm -hmm. So for them yeah. to be able to kind of at least say it to somebody else that is willing to listen. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Willing to listen. And that makes, that makes a difference. That makes a difference. So, you know, as we end, um, you know, finally, what would you have, like, as any final thoughts that you'd wanted to to leave the listeners? Um, I think I'm just thinking about, um, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about how there is a connection, just reflecting on, you know, um, on on this news that, that Lakshmi Pasod passed away. I, I, I'm just thinking about the value of literature to history. And I'm thinking about, um, so my dad's, if I look above my desk now, there's a, there's a picture of my great grandfather. And my great grandfather was from a minority community um, of South Indians. So they were a minority within a minority mm -hmm. if you know, during that period. And um, one of the first ways I came into contact with this story was through a novel called Hendry's Cure by a Guyanese politician who wrote a novel and it's it's um it's faction if you like it's a blend mm -hmm. of fact and fiction it's him telling the story of his great grandparents and it's the story of a South Indian community um who live in Babis in Guyana and it's really beautiful it's it's a fantastic novel but I remember um not long after Naipaul had died there was a display in a bookshop of of Naipaul's works and because Nagamutu's name <laughs> was also spelt with an N in the shelf I just stumbled across it and as soon as I saw the people tree press spine I realized oh this is a uh you know this is a people tree book it must be um you know it must be from Guyana or Trinidad or... and that's how I came across that book when I read it I called my dad and I said I've just read this brilliant book by this Guyanese writer and it's about this group who are a minority group in uh, in indenture this was like 2000 i think wow. and uh, they were um uh th there are some fantastic stories about them and he said i know he said i know that um because uh, my dad is that oh wow was part of that community and i was oh, just totally blown away yeah so not my the grandfather obviously mm -hmm. that we take our we take our name from but I've written about, I, that's what I did my master's on, uh, that story, that big, my story, my, my master's came from that book. Um, the inspiration for it was, was Henry's Cure. So I think just be aware of how much in, in our stories, yes. uh, stories from the Caribbean, just be aware of how much history is in literature. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it, there are so many treasures for you to, for you to discover. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but thank you so much, though, Maria, for coming on and to speak about this because it it just gives another perspective of us to how to kind of kind of look at things when you are going down that journey, down that path, and and what to kind of take with you as your armor and your tool belt uh, to kind of yeah. ask those whether asking those questions, but at least to be able to talk and discuss and to be open minded about it. So. 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Wendy. It's a pleasure to be asked to, to do this and to it was so nice to chat with you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please make sure to like, follow, subscribe, and write a review for the episode wherever you listen to your podcast. Thank you.